Witness is uh, Ms. Sh uh, Sharon uh, Squassoni, who has been analyzing arms control uh, and nonproliferation issues for 20 years. She is a senior associate in the nonproliferation program at the Carnegie Endowment for International uh, uh, Peace. She has also served in the nonproliferation and political military bureaus in the State Department. Uh, we welcome you. Uh, and whenever you are ready, please begin. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Markey and Ranking <clears throat> Member Sensenbrenner and other members of the committee for inviting me to provide comments on the topic of nuclear energy expansion and its contribution to mitigating global climate change. <clears throat> Chairman Markey, I would like to request permission to submit longer testimony <clears throat> for the record and will summarize my remarks here. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. In addition, I'd like to present a few graphics on nuclear expansion, which I understand is unorthodox, but in this case, uh, a picture may be worth a thousand words. Recent nuclear enthusiasm stems from several expectations, that it can help beat global climate change, meet rapidly increasing demand for electricity, combat rising costs for oil and gas, and provide energy security. The gap between expectations and reality, however, is significant. This morning, I'll focus on what it will really take for nuclear energy to make a difference in terms of global climate change and why this is unlikely to happen. As you can see on the first slide, global nuclear reactor capacity now stands at 373 gigawatts electric, or about 439 reactors. By 2030, under what I call a realistic growth scenario, which is based on U.S. Energy Information Administration figures, that capacity could grow about 20 percent. Oh, that's a little too far. <laughs> uh, yet since electricity demand is expected <clears throat> to almost double in that time, nuclear energy is unlikely to keep its market share, which could drop from the current 16 percent to 10 percent of worldwide electricity generation. In the U.S. alone, according to nuclear industry estimates, a stable market share for nuclear energy would require the U.S. to build 50 nuclear reactors by 2025. And at the same time, the U.S. would also be building 261 coal-fired plants, 279 nat natural gas-fired plants, and 73 renewables projects. This is based on, um, I believe, Booz Allen Hamilton information. States' plans for nuclear energy, however, may be anything but realistic. And what you're looking at now are these red dots, which is um, 2030 plans, the, the announced intentions of states for nuclear energy. In my second scenario, what I call the wildly optimistic one, the total re reactor capacity would reach about 700 gigawatts by 2030. This is not a projection, but rather takes at face value what states have announced they will do. More than 20 nations have announced intentions to install nuclear capacity that do not now have nuclear power plants, and more than half of these are in the Middle East. The final scenario depicts what an expansion to 1,500 gigawatts might look like, based roughly on the high-end projections for 2050 done by MIT in its 2003 study entitled The Future of Nuclear Power. I call this the climate change scenario. It's a little bit more than a Pakala Sokolov wedge, which is defined as the level of growth needed to reduce carbon emissions by more than 1 billion tons per year by 2050, which equals about 1,070 gigawatts. But it's less than the Stern report on climate change estimates that nuclear energy could reduce carbon emissions between 2 and 6 billion tons per year. The Stern numbers were literally off the map, so I, I did not include them here. For 1,500 gigawatt capacity, MIT estimated that 54 countries, which is an additional 23 compared to today, would have commercial nuclear power programs. This essentially means a five-fold increase in the number of reactors worldwide and an annual build rate of 35 reactors per year. If we go to the next slide, you can see, click again, what this looks like. This is 2030 and again 2050. These are all new nuclear power states. And then if you go to the next slide, you'll see a closer look. The darker the color, the, more, the firmer the plans are. And when I say announced intentions, some of these plans will never come to fruition. 
These expansion scenarios have implications for both the front and back ends of the fuel cycle, as the next graph shows building one nuclear wedge would require tripling uranium enrichment capacity. And so that's the first green bar that you see. The orange is today's enrichment capacity, about 50 million separative work units. And then the first green one is the climate change scenario. And as you see, it gets much larger if you go to the stern numbers. And new states could find it economically feasible to develop their own enrichment. If we go to the next slide. You'll see that's current enrichment capacity. Keep going. <laughs> and this is 2030 plans and then beyond climate change. You see a lot more states could potentially be enriching. These are also a little bit lower than the MIT numbers, uh, which estimated, I guess, that 18 countries would have enough reactor capacity to merit enrichment. It is unlikely that these expansion rates will be achieved, however. The U.S. has just a fraction of the nuclear infrastructure it had decades ago, two decades ago, and other countries have not fared much better. In the last 20 years, there have been fewer than 10 new construction starts in any given year. Industrial bottlenecks are significant now, particularly in forging reactor pressure vessels and steam generators. The sole company with ultra-large forging capacity, Japan Steelworks, has a two-year waiting list and when it completes its expansion in 2010, will only produce enough forging sets for eight reactors per year. The capabilities of alternative suppliers such as China are unknown. Other constraints include labor shortages, not just in engineers, but also craft and construction labor, and long lead times for components and materials. Financing is another huge topic worthy of a separate hearing. And the cost of inputs has risen significantly in recent years. Finally, the proliferation risks of nuclear expansion are not limited just to a three, four, or five-fold increase in the number of reactors. Some states may move forward anyway, propelled by unrealistic expectations, and could acquire uranium enrichment and plutonium separation capabilities. Such national fuel capabilities, fuel production capabilities, could introduce even greater uncertainty about proliferation intentions in regions like the Middle East, because of the latent nuclear weapons capability in such plants. Efforts to address both supply and demand for such sensitive capabilities need to be redoubled. The current policy debate paints nuclear energy clean and green, advocates nuclear energy for all, even though some states with nuclear reactors could pose significant safety and proliferation concerns, and suggests that nuclear energy is a path to energy security. At the same time, U.S. officials insist that some states forgo developing indigenous nuclear capabilities. This confused message obscures important policy considerations. If nuclear energy- Could you try to summarize, please? Last sentence. <laughs> if nuclear energy can't really make a difference in terms of global climate change, are the huge costs and risks worth it? Thank you. Thank